Hello, everyone. So, yeah, it's been a wild week again for me, but hey, here we are. So, hello again. It is I, Monty. Today, we're going to talk about the wild land of the plant kingdom. And then I'm going to complain bitterly about the dumbest plant on the planet, which, if you don't know, is the Bradford pear. So, strap yourselves in. This is going to be an interesting ride because plants really are uh the overlords of earth and and i for one welcome our new insect overlords and if anybody's arguing that point then uh yeah they may or may not be a botanist so let me go ahead and slideshow there we go Make myself a little bigger there. All right. So we're going to talk about the Lion Kingdom. Now, um, plants have been on land way longer than we have. And they definitely uh, turned the planet into a place that we could live. So without the plant kingdom, we'd probably still be hanging out in the oceans, having a good time eating each other. Because the oceans were pretty cutthroat back on primordial earth uh insanely so i am so glad i live on the land so so land plants we believe came from archaeoplastidia which basically includes the red algae and the green algae and um which kind of puts us at a fight in between it's like is green algae supposed to be in kingdom protista or is green algae supposed to be in king and the uh, uh, kingdom plant so and it's 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 kind of like you know back when twilight was huge and it was either uh, team edward or uh, team um the other guy you can tell i definitely so paid attention to that that's gonna bug me now it's team jacob mom anyway watch it will come to me at the end of the notes watch so anyway, so that's that's kind of how it is. It's like, well, does green algae live in protista or should it be slapped into kingdom plant? Um, because basically that's green algae is where the plant kingdom came up out of. So most biologists consider at least some green algae to be plants, although all others exclude all the algae from the plant kingdom. So it, it depends on who's fighting what. Again, this kind of gives people who uh, are, uh, you know, do, do a biological classification a job because they can argue this all day long and get paid for it. And they do. Which I just kind of find is slightly exhausting thought. Anyway probably why i'm a uh, zoology person not so much a botanist anyway but and trust me there's a lot of fights in zoology too that also leave me feeling kind of exhausted thinking about it so anyway plants were the first to take over the land however they had to figure out a couple of things and one of the things is um how do I live out of the water? See, there was a lot of pluses for getting up out of the ocean. Like I said, it was a cutthroat, eat everything, eat everything kind of universe. So we wanted to, uh, they, they, they knew there was a lot of, you know, unfiltered sunlight up there, which they could turn into food with photosynthesis, that new handy dandy thing. Um, but at the same time, and there was a ton of carbon dioxide up there. So they were all like, dude, there's like carbon dioxide. There's nobody to eat us. And there's a ton of, uh, car uh, and there's, you know, a whole ton of sunlight. We, it should be a paradise. But the problem was, and this is also going to problem when we talk about the evolution of, uh, out of the, uh, animal kingdom as well, uh, after we get back from spring break. And that is this, we, uh, had to figure out how to live without water. Water was a major uh, stunt factor, uh, stunting factor going on here, or limiting factor, excuse me. So basically, plants had to figure out, huh, how do I live on land without water? And we're going to see as we go through the different uh, plant uh, groups how they they conquered this. And first, they couldn't live too far away from water, thus they had to, you know, 
figure out, uh, you know, so a lot of the uh, the plants that first arose were living around coastal areas right next to the water or wherever they could find water so they couldn't leave the water because they needed the water for reproduction. They needed the water for living, period. And the sun would literally, the sun is still a deadly laser and it would suck all the water out of them. Um, so they came up with one of the things called tolerance. And for a lot of mosses, which is some of the simplest types of plants, the non-vascular plants, and we'll get into that in a minute, um, they dry out and turn into a brittle mat. But as soon as a rain or a flood comes through, the mosses absorb it and they're restored to their healthy green appearance. So sometimes you can hit mosses and actually transplant them pretty easy from water to water. Um, and they look dead and they're actually just hanging out and kind of like a in between state they're not really dead dead but um you know if they don't if they get water within a certain amount of time they'll go right back to being healthy and happy so that's called tolerance um like some plants still do it <laughs> like this one i love this i'm not dead this is just how i look <laughs> so there's a lot of plants that can pull that trick off so those were one of the first ones that really figured out how to live away. And then as they developed up and away, um, they developed in different ways so they don't dry out. And now we've got plants that live in insanely hot and or cold uh, arid uh, environments like uh, cacti. Cacti have a very, very, very thick uh, waxy cuticle and live in some places that even us humans don't want to live in. Or or um, some snakes, right, Monty? Snakes live in deserts. Yeah, I know there's sidewinders in the desert. I'm just saying they, they still can dry out, you know, and if they don't get water and stuff. I need heat to live. Well, you're also a tropical snake, so. Oh, yeah. Wet heat. Anyway. So that brings us to plant characteristics or how we break down plants. So plants as a whole, uh, I like to split them out in four groups. So... And if that's basically what we're going to look at is we're going to start with the simplest of the plants that came up out of green algae and then move on up as they develop and change into different types. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these, uh, the ancestors from which these plants came from no longer exist. And some of them do. Some of them we thought were extinct, like the ginkgo biloba tree. And then we found out that some Tibetan monks kept them alive in a monastery and now we have we can have ginkgo all over the place again so it's interesting plants we some we've lost their ancestors sometimes we've refound their ancestors it's kind of a funky thing going on right there so anyway so we're going to talk first about the non-vascular which is basically again these guys that had to deal with coming up out of the water and they can't live away from water and those and they also had to contend with getting water up into themselves because of gravity so this is why the non-vascular group is very very short um which is the mosses and related plants oh hello face hug time are you giving me a hug, you giving me a hug? Oh. i love my mommy and i want to go back to sleep he's so cute so anyway and then we move on to the seedless plants, and then we move into the vascular plants. These are the plants that have figured out how to get water to go up against gravity so they could grow taller. So the non-vascular couldn't figure that out, uh, didn't have developed cells, so that's why they stay very, very short. That's why mosses are all very, very short and are always in you know areas that are very, very wet. Um, but vascular, they figured out uh, certain cells like xylem and phloem, so that way they can transport uh, water and nutrients up against gravity, um, so that way they could grow taller and taller and taller and taller and taller. So that's the vascular plants, and we split them out into two, the seed plants and the seedless plants. The seedless plants are the ferns and the horsetails and stuff like that. We'll get into them in a minute. And then we get into the seed plants and those we split out into two, the angiosperms and the gymnosperms. And the gymnosperms are right now the ones doing pollen again upon us because that's how they reproduce. So we're gonna talk about, uh, yeah, now the weather's getting happy outside and all the plants are going with their pollen. We're gonna definitely talk about the gymnosperms and their pollen. And the angiosperms are the ones that we know um, are usually uh, 
like gym nail sperms are usually your pines um your i believe the ginkgos are up in here too angiosperms these are your hardwoods um some of your softwoods uh, they're the ones that produce fruit uh we like to cultivate them a lot because they produce fruit but in reality the plants are just using us guys i'm sorry but plant kingdom they are over our overlords and even as a zoologist and it hurts to say that as a zoologist and a botanist will laugh at me because it's true without the plant kingdom the animal kingdom couldn't have come about because the plant kingdom pretty much um you know landscape the universe uh, landscape the planet so that way we could come up out of the water afterwards and go hey well, it looks nice up here let's we should live up here too so thank you plants and they're still using us to this day they're still i mean they don't use you monty because you're you're a carnivore but you know us omnivores and um herbivores yeah we're under the thumb of plants they just use us that's true anyway we'll get into it so again, here we go. Non-vascular, very, very small. Mosses, liverworts, hornworts, war uh, their ancestrals are of the green algae. And then we move up when we figure out, hey, we can transport water up and away and we get the first vascular plants with ferns. That's why you like to see a lot of ferns in with dinosaur pictures and ginkgo biloba trees because those were hanging out too around the times of the dinosaurs. So um, actually they were even before that, so. Then you get up into the seed vasculars, which is the conifers, the first seed plants, and then into the flowering plants, which is the angiosperms. So gymnosperms are the conifers flowering. Any flowering plants are the um, uh, the angiosperms. A lot of them we get our fruit from. And living in Henderson County, where we're you know one of the apple capitals of the uh, country. You know, we're not the only one, but we're definitely up there. Monty, you can't know. You're escaping, and that's not cool, so stay put. Adventure calls mother. Yeah, I know. But, you know, you can't just leave. People like seeing you. Which is why I must go. I will go to them because they have not come to things. see me. Anyway, so let's go over some basic plant characteristics. A, they're autotrophic. They make their own food through photosynthesis. Plants can absorb nutrients from water and soil around them. 80% do with the help of fungi in their roots, which is the mycorrhizae. We talked about them last week. Uh, they prevent water loss through the adaption of a waxy cuticle. That's why um, if you feel you know, a plant leaf and it feels waxy, that's why it's, you're feeling the cuticle. And again, that's basically one of the things plants figured out over the years is like, if we develop this waxy put substance and put it all over ourselves, we don't lose water. So they have a very waxy cuticle um, and definitely the more uh, water sealed the plants are, the more the more you can feel a cuticle on it. Like, you know, if you've ever, you know, avoided touching the, uh, you know, uh, spikes on a um, cactus and just touch the cactus itself, it's very, very thick cuticle to prevent water loss. Um, but they also can't just cover themselves in wax because they'll die. So they actually have pores and these pores are called stomata, but they have really cool things. And they have these things called guard cells around the stomata. So where if it's dry, the guard cells will close the stomata so they don't lose uh, water. But if it's raining a whole bunch, all of a sudden all the stomata will open uh, the guard cells will open the stomata and the plants are breathing again. So it's actually really cool. Uh, I like to definitely in the springtime and the summertime after a good rainstorm, I like to say, and maybe it's just the crystal gripping hippie in me, but it's like when I go outside after a nice good rain and you could feel all the stomata opening and the plants breathing. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just a crazy lady with the snake. Right, Monty? Yes, you as crazy lady with but, snack. Um, you know, I like, I just feel like, I know after a good spring or summer rain, you can definitely feel the plants breathe because all their stomata is open. So anyway, plants are both sexual and asexual and they can reproduce on land, fertilizing each other with pollen, releasing seed. We do have some with spores still. Um, the ferns, we'll talk about the ferns. 
and um, which are fertilized by eggs and embryos in a protective shell of some sort. And this brings us to the alternation of generations where we go back and forth between um, diploid and haploid or seeds and spores until we go complete diploid haploid. So we're gonna talk about that a lot as we touch on each group because um, it's actually pretty uh, a lot. So anyway, plants are broken down into two categories. You got your non-vascular and your vascular. Again, vascular refers to a system of tissues in the plant that transport water and minerals within the plant. Non-vascular, couldn't get the hang of defeating gravity, so they stayed small, low to the ground, and close to the water. Vascular, on the other hand, figured out how to defeat gravity, and because of that, they are now big and tall and in trees and things like that. And once the trees were huge, and I don't know if you've ever gone out to the West Coast and gone and saw seen the redwoods. Oh, that is amazing. Highly recommend that and just checking out San Francisco. It's a hysterical place it's like a larger ash filled with weirdness also one of these days it's going to end up leveled again but you know we humans we like building in the dumbest of places and unfortunately i hate to knock san francisco but it is built upon the dumbest of things i'll get into that later if you want me to if you want me to get into my why san francisco should not be built where san francisco is built rant just give me a holler and i'll rant on that but i've got a rant for bradford pears a little later so anyway let's look at some major parts of a plant so if you're looking at a plant we've got you know a root system so we've got your your primary root sticking down and some roots we like eating like carrots yum yum and turnips um uh and then you got lateral roots sticking out you got your stem you got your leaves Get the blade of the leaf, the part that's, you know, from the stem is called the petriole. And then you've got an eight, uh, apical bud or a terminal bud at the top. Sometimes you have auxiliary buds coming out, depending on the plant on the side. Um, the node is basically where it splits. And uh, the internode is going in between. So there you go, the different types of leaves. So if you go ahead and then take your, you got, so there you break it out into the shoot system, which is above ground and the root system, which is below ground. Now, in some of these cases, like when we get into the vascular, but non-seeds like ferns, their stem is actually underground. And what we see above ground is just their leaves. The most of the plants underground. So they've just stuck their leaves up above and that's what ferns are. So you go, oh, look, a fern. You're really pointing at the leaf of a fern. The fern stem and everything else is actually all underground, which is kind of weird. Not what we usually think of. We think of like stem above ground with leaves, roots below ground, shoot system, root system, duh. But, you know, it's kind of interesting. So not all the plants got the memo. Actually, this is a newer memo, not an older memo. So anyway, if we take out a cross-section of a leaf, we're going to look at, again, we're going to talk about some of these things. So we've got the waxy cuticle on the outside. Um, so that way we, uh, they're not losing, they're not losing um, uh, water, but they're also, you know, areas where they can get lots of uh, sun and whatnot. And then again, we've got these guard cells right here. Here's the stomata and the guard cells surrounding it so they can open and close it. Um, our inside, you'll see the xylem and the phloem, and we'll talk about the difference between xylem and phloem. Basically, one of them's like a one-way street, and the other one's like a two-way street. It just depends on what's going on. And so we have veins of those. Again, here's the stoma. So stoma is for like just one, and stomata is like for talking about a bunch. Uh, the waxy cuticle. So we've got an upper epidermis, uh, the palisade parchema, the spongy parchema, and the lower epidermis epidermis so again i'm not going to beat you to death with this um i mean there are some teachers that absolutely go full on with you know plant kingdom and uh, that's it was kind of my thing is like should i split this into two sections should i not split this into two sections because i also need to cover ecology with you guys but you could spend for like a good two to three weeks uh in the plant kingdom because it's so 
important and so varied but at the same time we've got to move on and i'm also not a botanist and so i'm kind of crabby like that so again the four groups key features non-vascular plants so these are very small size very simple as the water and food in their bodies are transported by osmosis and diffusion alone and for osmosis and diffusion to work you've got to unfortunately keep it simple uh, diffusion doesn't happen over long distances. It will not. It's like air actually can diffuse outside and get through our skull to our cells. That does happen. But do you know how long it takes for that to happen? That's like, yeah, uh, your cells would be dead by the time an oxygen atom or an oxygen, you know, they like to hang out in pairs anyway. A pair of oxygen atoms actually makes it through to one of our cells. That's why we have lungs is to make sure that oxygen has the shortest route possible into our body through the parts of our lungs called the evoli um, into our blood. Now, there's only like three layers of cells between the evoli, which is the bubbles that make up your lungs, and going through into the blood vessels um, that surround your lungs so that way they can pick it up and move it around your body. So, yeah, diffusion can only happen over short distances if you want it to be really efficient. If you want inefficient diffusion, yeah, go ahead. You'll die, but, you know, efficient diffusion only happens over short spaces. So that's why non-vascular plants are very tiny, because things are only moving by diffusion and osmosis. Two very fundamental things, but they also require water for sexual reproduction. You'll see this too in the animal kingdom. You'll see where we come up and there's like certain groups of animals that still need water for re reproduction. Amphibians. Yes, amphibians. Monty's a reptile. He doesn't need water for reproduction because they figured out eggs. Yes. And Monty's species is so cool about that. Uh, funny story. Um, when they hatch... They, they stick their head out and then they go, yeah, I don't like that. And go right back in their egg for a while. Uh, ball pythons are actually well known to uh, hang out in their eggs for a while until they feel secure enough to leave. You know, like us trying to get out of bed. <laughs> it's like, do I feel secure enough to leave my bed? Maybe. It's all about security. It's got to feel secure. So anyway, they do not have a root system. They have rhizoids. So again, rhizoids, the word rhizoid. And there's three phyla in here. We've got the mosses, the bryophyta, the liverworts, the uh, hepatophyta. Hep hepatophyta. Come on, I can say these things. And the hornworts, the anthrosophyta. And they're, they're kind of named after uh, reception reproductive things. Yeah. You wonder what the hornworts are named after? We'll get to that. So anyway, uh, the bryophyta are like a huge. Mosses are actually really, really helpful. Um, God, I'd love, instead of a uh, lawn filled with uh, grass, I'd, I'd love a lawn filled with moss, but we'd have to keep it really wet. There's actually mosses up in our mountains that are actually antiseptic, um, if you know which ones. So like if you scrape your knee, you can literally rip up a bunch of this and put it on your scraped knee and it will keep your wound clean until uh, and um, until you can get back down the mountain without, uh, you know, and, and get some proper treatment, you know, flush out the wound and everything like that. So, yeah, you can actually use uh, some mosses up around here as uh, antiseptic for like, you know, short term, not long term. But yeah, um, we've got a lot of different mosses, liverworts, and hornworts all over the place. You probably, um, some of them right now are going to be popping up their uh, reproductive organs. You'll see that. So you can look at it and go, oh, what's that? So we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm just going over some, some basic points before I get into other points. And then we move over to our seedless vascular plants. So this is basically um, uh, our dear friends, the ferns. So this has a vascular system with both a xylem and a phloem. The xylem is made up of hard-walled nutrients that transport water and nutrients. Uh, the phloem is plant tissue that's made of soft-walled cells and transport organic materials. Like I said, one is usually an up only and the other one is a, a back and forth. And I want to say the xylem is up only and the phloem is back and forth, but watch, I've got that backwards. And it's annoying because 
I just reread the book on Monday about this to refresh myself. But so many things happened on Monday. Anyway, um, and the reason I didn't record on Monday like I should have is because my son woke up with a very high fever and was not feeling good. So I took care of him all Monday. So you know how it is, kids. Anyway, they have drought-resistant spores, which means they can live in drier habitats. And you'll see this in the fall, definitely. Um, if you flip over ferns, you'll see all these uh, like rocky-looking things on the back of the fern. That's their spores. We'll get into that in a minute, too. They have rhizomes rhizomes excuse me which are horizontal underground stems so they have roots but they also have rhizomes their stems are underground so what we're seeing on the above ground is just the leaves of the plant the main part of the plant's actually underground as i said earlier so we got the ferns uh terophyta which are no also known as fronds uh the club mosses lycophyta horsetails uh sporangophyta and whisk ferns uh silotophyta Whisk ferns. Horsetails are cool because horsetails you can actually use to clean. Um, Native Americans used to use them to clean um, their uh, dishware. They actually kind of have a little bit of a natural soap with um, with um, hold on a bit of grit to it and you can use it to actually clean off uh, pots and pans. So yeah. Horsetails are actually quite useful. Of course, most plants are actually quite useful. That's why we enjoyed cultivating them, so we have food. So anyway, vascular plants, gymnosperms. So these guys, finally we've hit seeds. Now we can actually have our children go off into the universe without drying out so they don't die on the trip. And that's why seeds are important, because we want to propagate the species, but we want to propagate them over there. You know, kids got to leave the nest. In, in these two groups, the kids don't leave the nest that far. But in this group, these groups, we've invented seeds, self-contained babies, so we can make them go out there somewhere. Right, Monty? He's like, yes, I'm going out there somewhere. God, I hate, should just stop the background, but anyway. So, pollinated by the wind, which we hate right now, because we're covered in it. Um, known as the most successful of the plant kingdoms and yeah this 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 is the ones that took off these are the guys that really took off you know the 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 you know the va the non-vascular were like okay we we've, we've made it we've we've we're on the land sort of kind of not really and then the vascular plants were look we're we're farther away in in the land and then finally they went bam we figured it out let's go and conifer the gymnosperms took over and boy did they so anyway they've got four phyla that is the conifers the conifer phyta the cycle cycads the cyclodophyta the ginkgo the ginkgo phyta and the neophytes or the neophyta uh like i said the ginkgo was thought to be extinct and uh they weren't they were saved by tibetan monks weird and we just happened to it was weird uh there was a botanist roaming around and i think he caught wind of a story of trees you know looking like some of the ones we found in fossils and somebody said yeah i saw that and he's like where and they're like oh um up in this monastery in tibet and he's like no way and he did he went up there and then you know he went up there on a an excavation and I said, do you have these trees with this looking, you know, leaf? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's in our courtyard. Brings them back. And yeah, there they are. The ginkgo trees. We thought were extinct. Saved by Tibetan monks. Isn't that crazy? Um, also, ginkgo are weird because they actually have a separate male plant and female plant. And oh, my God, the female plant stinks. I don't know if you've ever lived next to a female ginkgo tree Oh, God, they smell. Anyway, that's why it's better to live next to a uh, male ginkgo tree. Anyway. Anyway, vascular plants. These are the angiosperms. These guys have flowers. They produce fruits to help disperse their seeds inside. In other words, they use us. Yep. This is the group that figured out how to use the stupid animals that came up after them these guys were the ones that are already there when the animals popped up and they were like hi animals and these are the guys that said you know we should start using these idiots to our advantage 
and they did and we still let them so you know hey i'm not going to argue i enjoy i enjoy fruit anyway so they have an endosperm uh supply of food that they can use in development mainly when they're still embryos and we divide them into two subgroups the monocots which are flowering plants that produce seeds with uh, one leaf and produce flowers in multiples of three they have long, narrow leaves and parallel veins. We'll get into that in a minute, the difference. So mono means one. So they do things in prime numbers or not prime numbers, um, odd numbers. So they're the ones with odd numbers, like one seed leaf, uh, flowers and multiples of three uh, and parallel veins. Like think, think, prime. Uh, why do we keep saying prime numbers? Two is a prime number. Shut up, Lauren. Um, Monty? Yes? You need to, like, you know, tell me to stop saying the dumb words sometimes. But I know word good also. Like, no, mommy, I don't feel like it. Anyway, um, so odd numbers. Monocots, mono means one, odd numbers. Dicots, even numbers. Die means two. So flowering plant produces seeds with two seed leaves. So when it pops up, it has two little leaves. Uh, flower plants with multiples of two, four, or five. Now, you may be like, hey, you said odd numbers, monocots. Yeah, five is in the dicots. Don't, I didn't come up with this. Botanists, go yell at them. Zoologists, that's me. Anyway, and they have leaves with uh, branching veins. So, yeah. All right. Here are five ways to let you know the difference between the two. So monocots, about 50,000 species. Um, so the flowers bear se uh, petals in multiples of three. So always like three, six, or nine. This one's got six. Their stems are uh, simple, soft, vascular bundles, very randomly scattered. So these guys are simpler than the dicots, and we'll get into that. So if you're looking at a, a cross-section under a microscope, you know it's a monocot when you just see all the vascular, which is all these little holes. These are all the things going up and down the stem. Very simple, just randomly thrown about, randomly strewn about. Um, they have one uh, cotalon, which is a, our seed leaf, uh, you know, when it first blooms it pops one up grasses monocots are definitely in the grass corn is a grass if you didn't know that so corn is in the monocot dimension uh so they have parallel veins so they have those uh, line the veins just go on all in one line so if you're looking at a leaf and you see it all like goes in one line like corns does i don't know if you've ever played i mean you've shucked have you ever shucked corn i hope you've shucked corn because, you know, when you're ripping the stuff off the corn, you'll see it's all going in parallel lines with each other. Uh, those are the uh, veins. Uh, the monocot root is often very fibrous. It's all over the place. So very, very fibrous. Um, some, uh, some produce some roots such as bulbs and rhizomes. Notice um, how the root looks. It's definitely got a double circle going on. So if you see a cross section of a root and you see this double circle right here, that should tell you that's a monocot. Um, over here, dicots have two little leaf seeds or seed leaves or cotillions. And basically flowers are usually in uh, two, four, five. So groups of fours or fives. Leaves, if you zoom in, and you look at it, it looks like you know a crazy city a highway system, road system. Then there you go. Very simple or compound. They have reticulate veins that have intricate edges. There's like people that like to take and use art. Like they go pick up some maple leaves, which is a dicot, by the way. They get maple leaves and then they like, you know, get out all this stuff and just leave the veins and then they preserve it or, you know, fill in the parts and make it all colorful. I've seen people do artwork like that or they, they get rid of all the stuff in between, leave the veins and cover it in metal. That's some really pretty work. Anyway, so yeah, dicots are the ones they like to work with like that. Stems. Now, the dicot stem system is way more complex than a monocot. So as you can see, it's very organized. It has a center core, a pith with a woody portion that contains a cortex around here and the bark on the outside. So these guys have 
a way more definition. And as you can see right here, instead of, you know, the uh, vascular bundles just all over the place, you can see all the vascular insanity right there in the middle. And that's basically where your xylem is going to be. The woody part is the, remember, xylem is very hard walled. So that your xylem is going to be in the middle and your phloem will be on the outside protected by the bark. So the cortex is usually the phloem, the inside is the xylem, fun stuff like that. Roots, again, you'll see it all over the place. Um, it's very woody. Uh, as you can see right here, like our friend uh, has a very large tap root that goes down. Um, some of them we can eat like carrots, some of them we can't. Oh yeah, over here with the monocots, this is where we got sod. Um, so sod is basically all the grasses, all the root systems tangled up together. And that's actually what happened as we went into the West. And uh, we actually would cut up to try and get uh, to farm, you know, the land out West, uh, those flat grassy plains. But what we did was A, start our own dust bowl. Yeah, the dust bowl was from us cutting up the grasses that were holding all the dirt in place. And we cut it all out and made sod houses. And it was these huge, dense bricks of just literal roots tangled together. And we take that out we like so we could get down to the dirt so we could farm the dirt. But in doing that, the dirt was all now loosey-goosey. And when the uh, storms kicked up, yeah, everybody was covered in dirt. And killed all the plants, killed lots of things. And yay, the Great Depression. So... Yeah, the Great Depression was, and uh, the Great Dust Storms, kind of our fault. Actually, completely our fault. So, yeah. That's what happens when you go in and completely screw up an ecosystem. All right. That brings us to our favorite thing in the world that we're going to pretty much be yapping about from here on in. Is alternation of generations. So, Plants have a life cycle, and it's called alternation of generations. In this, we have a gamete-producing side and a sporophyte-producing side. And they change for each of the four major groups of plants. Now, and you're going to see that. One's usually dominant, the other one's not dominant. And you'll notice one's haploid and one's diploid. The sporophyte is always a diploid, 2N. Haploid is a gametophyte because it makes a separate sperm and egg. Okay. So what happens is it always alternates between these two types of generations going on. So the gametophytes, again, what happens is you go through meiosis, you make haploid spores. It splits into making a separate sperm and egg, and then they come together and fertilize. This is usually where the pollen is because the pollen is uh, basically plant sperm. So pollen, if you're allergic to pollen, congratulations, you're allergic to plant sperm. That's what's driving your sinuses crazy. Isn't that fun, Monty? No. Where is your head? I am afraid of the pollen now. Oh, there you are. Hi. Where are you going? Away from this pollen stuff. So anyway, gametophytes produce um, the gametes, which is eggs and sperm, and such structures called the uh, archeogonum, which basically makes the eggs, and the antheridium, which makes the sperm. Both of which, when we talk about flowers, when we talk about, you know, the, uh, the uh, oh my God, my brain just died. Anyway, we get over to the fourth group after the gymnosperms. Come on, you can do it. Come on, brain. But anyway, they um, they uh, they actually uh, keep all their organs in one spot, which is uh, flowers, which is hysterical because you know we give each other flowers as a token of love, and what we're doing is we're actually giving each other the uh, sexual organs of plants. It's like, hey, I love you. Here's some sexual organs of plants. And now that I've completely ruined romance for you, we'll move on. So anyway, non-vascular plants, basically they have uh, a gametophyte generation, which is dominant. 
Okay. So if you go back here, so here's the gametophyte. So they have the haploid generation that's more dominant than their sporophyte or diploid half. So again, fertilizes, makes a sporophyte, sporangium, and then they'll go through meiosis again to make haploid spores come together. Fertilization goes round and round. So let's talk about the non-vascular plants. So we're talking about mosses. So um, they're the only plants with a life cycle in which the gametophyte generation is dominant. Uh, their familiar green photosynthesis are the gametes. So what you're looking at, that adorable, fuzzy, uh, little cuteness that you hang out and you're like oh this this moss is so far so soft and wet um yeah that's you're looking at the gametophytes so the sporangia generation is very small and very dependent on the gametophyte plant and this is actually where we get into classifying a lot of these guys so they actually have very distinctive male or female reproductive organs that actually come up above so again, you got your rhizoids underneath. They don't have true roots. They have rhizoids and you, they bud and they grow up and then they'll actually have a male and a female version that come up. Now, when you see this um, on some of these things, uh, you're going to see this on the horn warts and everything. They actually look like little horns coming up. That's why they're called horn warts. So, which I can make a joke about that. But that just feels like low-hanging horns. Anyway, so anyway, in order for fertilization to occur, a, uh, a sperm must swim in a drop of water. Yeah, from the uh, anthertegium to an egg in the antergonium. So yeah, a sperm has to. These guys have to get wet again. They couldn't get away from water. Uh, and then a sperm has to swim over into the female. Boy, you thought our reproduction was insane. Anyway, actually, no, it gets so many other tree protective systems are way more insane than ours. Um, so then what happens is that fertilization takes place. Uh, a zygote develops into a tiny sporophyte. So yeah, here's the anthereal head with the sperm coming out and um, the archegonal head where it has to basically get over here, go down and find this little opening, which is called a venter, go down and find the egg inside. And then it fertilizes. So inside the venter, it fertilizes and then make an embryo. And then it makes, and I am in the way of this and I don't know if this will show me moving myself over to the other side here. I hope it does so you can see this image or open up the notes I saved so you can follow along. Um, so as you can see, it comes in here and then it makes a little, has a little foot. Uh, sporophyte then on the, on the parent gametophyte plant and then it shoots up here. So in the female, so for right here, it'll shoot up the seta with a capsule inside. So on the female, so yeah, this is all happening inside the female because the male already did his job. So the female is now growing. After a while, the female will grow this up out of her. And that is the product of the children and the sporophyte. And it makes spores and the spores go off in the wind because they're actually um, uh, will not lose. Unlike the seeds, like I said, they don't even have seeds in this end. So the spores will survive without drying out, but they'll land in something wet and that will make them grow and they'll bud and they'll go back around again to doing all this stuff. So that's basically the sporophyte produces haploid spores and these develop the next generation of the gametophyte plants. Then the cycle repeats if environmental conditions are correct. Some of these guys, like I said, can lay in wait and be dead for ages and then they get enough water and then whoop, they're back. So, and some of that we use to our advantage. Um, and actually that's how some of these guys got around as uh, all over the place uh, because of humans. We used them as packaging because they dry out so nicely. And we we're like, hey, we can stuff this with packaging as for packaging. And um, yeah, stuff would get sent in uh, uh, moss and that's how moss would unfortunately get around because of humans. Or not unfortunately for the moss, but sometimes unfortunately for the uh, environments that the moss got into. Anyway, 
So that's basically what's going on with vascular. It's very dependent on water. Like I said, if there's no water for the uh, sperm to get to the female uh, mature gametophyte, then nothing's going to happen. Um, and then out of the female comes these little things. And this is basically where you call the horn warts, why they're called horns, because what's happening is this is the capsules coming up filled with this, the, uh, the uh, diploids, uh, diploid spores. And then it pops and then the spores drop and it's usually dropped around basically where the parents are. So that's how it spreads bit by bit. They can't, they don't go very far. They can't go very far. They have to be near a lot of water. So that's why you find, you know, most of your things in extremely damp areas. Uh, so there you go. That's the vascular plant version of the life cycle. Now for... A video that I'll skip over right now. No, or no, go, shoot. All right, there we go. So here we go, xylem and phloem. Oh, I was right, thank God. So anyway, if you're looking at xylem and phloem under a microscope, and we wanna talk about xylem and phloem because we're leaving the vascular plants now, we're heading over in, I mean, the non-vascular and we're heading into the vascular. And what I wanna talk about Angiosperms. Why? Why did I think about it now? God, my brain is slow. Anyway, so the xylem and the phloem under a microscope. So if you check it out, xylem is one way. It has very thick walls, woody, 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 woody stuff is mostly xylem. So if you're looking at, if you chop wood and you look at it, if it's spongy and soft on the inside, it's usually phloem you're looking at. If it's xylem, it's the harder stuff. So one way flow goes up. It's like a straw going up and uh, water and minerals going up. Uh, there's no end uh, walls between the cells. So when a cell grows on, it doesn't form a, a cell wall here, just on the sides. And they stiffen with ligonin or ligonin, 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 which is interesting because you can actually use ligonin to actually, um, and this is all hiker's trick to actually strengthen the skin on your feet. Um, I was told this by one of my professors and I will tell this upon to you. There are certain barks off certain trees and now I can't remember the tree off the top of my head, but Monty, you're so wiggly today. You are just, you don't wanna talk about plants, do you? Anyway, um, so what happens is uh, the lignin inside of it is, uh, what happens if you boil the bark in water and then take the bark out of the water, let the water cool down and put your soak your feet in the warm water, you know, not the boiling water, the warm water, wait till it cools down a bit. Um, the lignin actually will uh, get into your cells on your feet and actually uh, toughen up your feet. So that way you can hike more without getting um, blisters and stuff. Of course, having decent fitting shoes help too but i'm just saying this is an old hiker hiking trick they'd, they'd find that tree they'd take some of the bark they'd boil it and then they'd plop their feet in the water um and let the lignin go up into their uh their cells on their feet so that way it toughen up the skin so just you know just in case you never know when you might find that useful anyway flow on the other hand has a two-way flow it's water and food uh, so these are usually water and minerals, water and food, and they have end walls, but they have perforations. And this helps things go up and down against gravity. So that way it can't entirely, uh, we're not worried about the backflow like we are in the animal kingdom. If we talked about the difference between veins and arteries, um, if our arteries actually have valves, so it prevents backflow when we're returning blood from the heart, which is why we don't have two more hearts in our feet to pump it back up. Um, we have valves that prevent uh, the blood from going uh, back down with gravity. So we have anti-gravity things in our own body. Right, Monty? No, he doesn't care. Anyway. What is gravity anyway? So again, water and minerals go up and photosynthesis products need to go down because these guys aren't getting the sugars. The leaves where the sugars are being produced 
uh, from photosynthesis have to get back down to the roots because we've got to keep these cells alive. So that's basically why the root system and the, I mean, the root system and the shoot system have to work together. So that's why we need phloem to bring things up to the top as well as bring things down to the bottom. So that way they get the results of all their hard work of pulling out mineral uh, water and minerals up to the leaves where all the photosynthesis happens. And then all that, you know, delicious glucose comes down so that can feed their uh, mitochondria down here. So it all works together. All right, vascular plants. So unlike non-vascular plants, all vascular plants, including the seedless, have a dominant sporophyte generation. So instead of having a dominant gametophyte generation, which is what mosses are, we have more spermatophytes going on here in the non uh, the non-vascular or vascular seedless vasculars. So, a mature sporophyte fern has familiar leafy fronds. I mean, I I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure hopefully you've all seen a fern in your life. I'm hoping. I mean, I have run into people that make me question things. So hopefully you don't make me question that, but you know. So anyway, if we start here at our mature sporophyte, what happens is that after a while uh, on the undersides, if you flip it over at certain times of the year, usually late summer, early fall, you flip them over and you'll notice there's all these little bumps, these hard bumps. And the underside are just, this is sporangia. So basically they produce spores to develop into tiny heart-shaped gametophytes. And then the gametophytes have anthridia and ar ar uh, archegonia and uh, produce sperm, which have many cilia and the archegonia prevent, uh, pre make eggs. Fertilization occurs when the sperm swim to an egg on the inside of the archegonium and the resulting uh, zoophyte develops into an embryo that becomes a new sporophyte plan. And then the cycle repeats. So again, if, we, if you're walking through the forest and then you notice all of these ferns and then you flip it over and you see all these little spori, the, those are the clusters of sporangia. So they'll release into spores. And these guys will basically make these, these things, and this is happening usually in the dirt. So he germinates. Here's the gametophyte, and he'll have um, areas that basically make sperm and areas that make eggs. They come together. And this is happening in the wetness of the water. Yeah. And then they fertilize, and then a new sporophyte pops up. And then again, the root system grows out, uh, which is also the stem system. So the stem and root system, the rhizoid grows out, and the leaves pop up. And again, we have it going on. So the one we know, the one we, this is why it's dominant. It is uh, spor sporangia, the sporophyte, the diploid half of the life cycle is the dominant life cycle that we see. You don't see the haploid very much, very rarely. You see the diploid big time. So there are diploid or, sporan or uh, sporophyte, uh, or uh, yeah, sporophyte dominant generation. Do, do, do. So let's talk about the non-seed vascular, uh, vascular plants or the gymniosperms. So these produce seeds in cones and we all know pine cones. We've all seen pine cones, but did you know there's actually two different sexes of pine cone? I bet you didn't know that. Or if you did, cool. Um, yeah, there's actually the, the ones we play with a lot of the times are turn into nice artsy fartsy and stick all over our houses in fall. So we get that nice warm fall feeling. Those are female pine cones. The ones we like to play with a lot are female pine cones. Um, and do stuff with and turn into artsy crafts and decorate our houses with. Yeah, we're, we're messing with, uh, female pine cones. Male pine cones live at the top. So anyway, the gymnosperm life cycle has a dominant sporophyte life cycle. So both gametophyte and next year sporophytes develop on the sporophyte parent plant. So cones form on a mature sporophyte plant. So here's a mature sporophyte plant. This is what we know as a pine tree. And at the very top, they'll make 
uh male pine cones and they look weird they kind of some of them look like if you put um rice krispies on a on a stick uh because what's happening is they're making microsporangium which is basically goes through meiosis and turns into pollen and that covers everything and we are usually allergic to it Collageden is coming anyway and then they just kind of fly and they let the wind take them. And that's why they're high up. That's why you see uh, the male pine cones very, 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 very high up in the tree because that's to maximize them getting hit and spread by the wind. Then the pine cones, the females are usually around where we can grab them near the bottom. Because if you think about it, if we two, put two pine trees together, if the, you know, the, uh, stuff's at the top the, the male pine cones are at the top and the wind blows it it's gonna you know gravity still works it's gonna come down and hit somewhere in the mid and bottom of the uh, next door tree and that's gonna hit the female pine cones that's why the female pine cones are in the mid going down to the uh, bottom of the tree uh, so that way they get maximum you know hit from the uh, uh, pollen and then the single scales are actually turned into seeds. That's why some of them, when you find them when they're older, they they look like they're very, uh, you know, things have been missing from them or somebody's been chewing on it. Actually, it's because the seeds, the single, each one of these scales turns into a seed. So then it goes through meiosis, turns into a megaspore on the underside. And that's where the, and it has an opening where the archegonium is. And so what happens is the uh, pollen by wind somehow gets in there but hey it's worked for them it's worked so good that they're the most like these guys with wind sex have actually you know become the most successful of all the, the uh you know parts of the uh, plant kingdom so you know no knocking it it works even though it drives us all insane what do you think monty you keep disappearing here i am going invisible and um Oh, you disappeared again. There you are. Anyway, so yeah, pollinates, embryo turns into the seed with a wing. And then again, that can go fluttering off, off of the cones and land, hopefully in a nice patch of soil and grow into a brand new tree, which is a mature sporophyte. So the trees we're seeing are sporophytes. So they're, the sporophyte is the dominant thing that we see. It's the dominant part of the plant. Um, so, yep. And yep, I think I covered this. Yep, 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 yep. I'm just reading to make sure I covered everything I was going to say. Yep. And then it germinates, grow into another mature sporophyte tree. So we're looking at those like, so if you go back, you see that we, again, the mature sporophyte here is the, or the diploid is what we see here again, mature sporophyte, it's the diploid. So we see a diploid individual. We're diploid individuals as well, but we don't have spores, so we're not with sporophytes. Yes, we aren't spores, are we? No, we're not. We're not plants. Yay. All right, last but not least, how do the angiosperms do it? Well, same way. Uh, Sort of, not really, kind of. We actually, the angiosperms are the ones that decided to start making use of those stupid, weird animals that came out of the sea and started wandering all over the place and eating them. And they were just like, hey, rude. Um, so they were like, fine, if you're going to eat us, we're going to put you to use. <laughs> so they've evolved a lot of reproduction adaptations, which has very much contributed to their success. So like all vascular plants, their life is dominated by the sporophyte generation. So the plants we see, like apple trees and pretty, pretty flowers, which we should be, you know, planting here soonish around that time-ish. Actually, no, you should always wait until after uh, Mother's Day because uh you never know what march is going to throw at you because like this week could be nice and next week could be absolute ew so similar to what was going on with the gymniosperms the angiosperms basically what's going on is we have both the male and the female parts in one place instead of sticking one at the top of the tree one at the bottom they said let's combine it and put it in a pretty pretty shell so that way it tells the insects to come on down. 
So, and it does. Um, the reason why flowers are so pretty and have different colors and all sorts of like that is if you look at an ultraviolet light, you, that's actually kind of how the insects see it through their multiple eyes, their compound eyes. Um, it looks like runways. It does. And it's so cool. Um, I wonder if I could bring that up. Here, hold on. Monty, chill for a minute. Let's bring up what plants, what, let's bring that up, shall we? No, go back. All right, so let's go ahead and put up. Uh, flowers under UV light. Yeah, check that out. Check out the differences. Like, like we see a yellow. Like, check that out. We see a yellow dandelion, but insects see... We're all look at how it has a, a it's, it's white, but goes into red where all the pollen is because it's literally like, hey, here's the pollen. Come get the pollen. Here's the pollen. And that's literally why, you know, it looks pretty to us. Like, here's a nice dandelion. Oh, that's nice. And or if you, you know, want to mow it over or something. I don't know. I don't know how your I don't know how your relationship with dandelions is. I don't want to impose. But again, same thing here. Um, Yeah. This is how insects see it. So you see a brown-eyed Susan, and they see a place that says, hey, this dark spot's where all the pollen is. Let's go for that. Yeah. And uh, when we started looking at plants under UV light, again, you know, notice, you know, how this is, where it's going. It's like, hey, check out this pollen. It's basically to attract insects to let it know. Yeah, where the pollen is, so it knows where to go. Isn't that crazy? So insects see in UV light, so flowers look to them like completely different. Isn't that neat? I just thought that's just so cool. Yeah, here's a whole bunch of different ones. So like you can see, it's like, it looks yellow to us, but in the middle, it's like, here's the pollen, guys. Come on for it. Pretty cool. So this one. I'm doing some stuff on UV and stuff. Anyway, where were we? Where we're back here. So let's go back to here. Anyway. So. Uh, so basically what happens is flowers are the dominant uh, flower form on the dominant sporophyte plant. And consists of highly specialized male and female reproductive organs. Now, which is known as the pistil and the stamen. So the pistil is the female part and the stamen is the male part. We've probably seen these. I mean, if you've ever looked at some flowers, you know, somebody handed them off to you and you went, oh, thank you. Oh, or something like that. You, you've you noticed these parts that stick up. So this is this is the male part. Oh, I've lost my I've lost my laser pointer. There we go. We're back. So this is the male part sticking up. And this is basically the anther. Now, plants that can self-pollinate, the stamen is always taller than the pistil because the pistil's the female part. If they if it doesn't self-pollinate, the stamen is shorter than the pistil, so it doesn't accidentally get in. Um, and yeah, that's true. So look at a look at some flowers now that we're getting into flower season um soon. Go look at, see if it's self-pollinating or not. If the stamen is taller than the pistil then guess what? It can self-pollinate. But if the stamen is uh, smaller than the pistil, it cannot self-pollinate. So they even, isn't that interesting how long they grow is dependent on if they can self-pollinate or not. So size, size matters, guys. <laughs> so anyway, what happens is, so this is the ovary right inside the pistil. And inside there are the eggs. So they're the uh, macrospore ovule. And on the other hand, in the anther here is a whole bunch of uh, sperm cells go through meiosis, basically turn into pollen. This is what bees pick up. And uh, what happens is depending on which pollinator, because I mean, I mean, angiosperms use pretty much almost anything as a pollinator, mostly insects, um, us. Some of them use animals. Little snots. There are there are flowers that are like they're hanging upside down, and they're actually designed to do that. So, like if a deer walks under it, 
they get hit by the deer and the pollen knocks off on the deer's uh, fur and then deer goes walks under another plant and the pollen then gets up into the um the pistol and gets into the ovary so yeah angiosperms use anybody willing to do it um they use us so welcome to your new o- meet your meet your overlords the angiosperms <laughs> they use us just as much as we use them so anyway but it works out in the end for everybody i guess anyway so anyway what happens is the pollen gets in top of there and goes down and gets in and sort of fertilizes and then turns into a seed and then we have a seed and then we take those seeds and we plant them in our garden and then we have more sporophytes so, so remember so the one of the things i want you to take away from from all of these alternation of generations going on here is this oh no all right so notice the gametophyte in the non-vascular plant is the dominant life form it's what we see when we look at moss however no hush hank we'll talk to you later go away but and everybody else it's the diploid form that we see the uh the sporadophyte so again in the on the vasculars so notice non-vascular the gametophyte um is dominant and the vasculars the sporophyte is always the dominant of the alternation of generations. So hopefully I made this not too painful for you. So again, let's go in and look at different parts of the flower. So uh, the, sti- uh, the stigma is at the top. This is the pistil. This is the, uh, you know, your ovule inside with the eggs and whatnot. And here's the anther and the anthers are held up by filaments. And then we've got the petals and the and the, the little green bits underneath are called the septals, and there's your stem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to go over. But again, this this basically was saying what I, I kind of beat myself to talking about it. If, you know, some plants uh, do uh, can do uh, pollination, comes in self-pollination and cross-pollination. Self-pollination is basically where your anther is, is taller than your uh, pistil and drops into the stigma. Uh, so it can self-pollinate, but usually uh, if the anther is, uh, you know, shorter than the pistil, then that's cross-pollination. And that's basically where bees or insects or even us with paintbrushes, um, yeah, we do it sometimes. Actually, we've messed up gourds because a lot of gourd plants, uh, squash plants, actually have uh, to be pollinated by moths. And moths, we've unfortunately kind of hurt some populations of moths that only work with certain types of gourds so we actually have to have workers go out and cross-pollinate fields of gourds with paintbrushes and stuff or uh uh uh, q-tips i'm not kidding you that's a job you go out and you pollinate gourds all night long because they're only um susceptible when uh to pollination is when the moths are active and moths are active in the twilight and yeah so there is jobs where you get to go out and pollinate plants for a living because we need we we like those gourds yeah so because we've unfortunately hurt the moth population so much that the moth population can't keep up with uh our uh depend our uh, cultivation this is why we get really annoyed because um pollinators uh without them we'd be screwed we'd be out of like most of our agriculture we depend so much on pollinators and that's why a lot of people unfortunately got it a little bit wrong and they're like save the bees save the bees and they're not necessarily talking about the european honeybee and that's the thing a lot of people go save the bees and you think oh the european honeybee and yeah they're under threat too um we've got you know like i said we've got some issues definitely with them i'm not saying but they're pretty darn saved we're we're very in tune with our european honeybee brothers and sisters actually they're all sisters except for the few brothers that are only around for mating and that's it um so our sisters it was international women's day earlier this week so yeah i should right on power to the sisters anyway so um yeah but we're also talking about all the native bees too because the native bees are responsible for pollinating a lot of our native um flora so that's why you need to go uh 
you know, and be a little more conscious and not destroy all the bees, even though I know the stupid wood boring bees are dumb as mud and annoying as heck, but they do actually pollinate uh, native species around here. So we do need them as much as we hate them eating up and drilling holes in our decks. We do need them. So you can actually buy uh, native bee houses. Um, they're actually like a whole bunch of like uh, sticks. Uh, they're hollowed out and you can buy them and put them out and the bees will actually make little host houses out of those. Those are for your more, uh, the bees that live around here. They're not necessarily honeybees. Uh, they're a bunch of little different bees, but um, go out and buy some bee houses and put out some bee houses. Honestly, it makes the bees happy. And the more uh, natural pollinators we have around here, the better. Uh, so, because those are the ones that are pollinating our uh, local, you know, because they make a big push for, you know, have local, don't don't pull in, you know, plants from other places. And it's kind of true. It's, it's we want to preserve our mountains the way our, we found our mountains. And um, doing that is by, uh, you know, helping our local pollinators survive and by, uh, you know, uh, using native plants because they're happiest in this environment. So love them. Anyway, so yeah, honeybees are, you know, in danger, uh, but all their, all, all their pollinators are in danger too. And especially it's really annoying because I do live right across from uh, the orchard that belongs to the birch vineyard. And, you know, when they're, and I get it, we, we've got insects, we don't want them eating our apple crop and our apple crop is, you know, very much dependent, but it's like, it's, it's trying to find that happy medium, you know, where it's like, we want the bad insects off our freaking crops, but we need to make it so the uh, insecticides we use doesn't kill all our pollinators. And that's what's happening. We want to save the pollinators, but kill off the idiots that get up in our apples and eat them. You know what I mean? So it's it's hard finding that that happy medium of an insecticide that only goes after the things that destroys our crops, but doesn't kill our pollinators. Because that's what we're looking at right now. We're killing off our pollinators where insecticides to save our crops. But at the same time, without the pollinators, we wouldn't have crops in the first place. See, it's, it's a catch-22. So maybe one of you will go on in science and figure out a better way to get rid of the insects that eat our crops and save the pollinators that help make our crops. All right. Again, he does a great job on going over vascular plants. No, we're not looking at that. We're not, no. Oh, God, reproduction. Yeah. That, that. Am I at the end? I can't be at the end of the notes. This Bozeman science. Am I at the end? Oh, my God. I have, yeah, there's like, I know I just condensed the entirety of plants into like one go, but. Uh, that's why there's so many videos because plants are like psychotically important and i would highly recommend going through and watching these before you take a quiz or anything like that nope yeah i'm at the end that's how many that's how many things i had yeah so how many videos that's one two three six six videos yeah and it's just that important to watch actually go and watch all those so highly recommend you go watch all those um so now I want to get on my rant while well, we have a little bit of time left um, of the Bradford pear, the dumbest tree that every botanist worth their salt or biologist hates. The Bradford pear tree. You should be seeing them right now. They're blooming and they're dumb and they should be burnt to the ground. And you may think, wow, that's really rough of you. Why would you want to kill these trees? Because they're bad and they're dumb and we made them. Oh my God. So what happened was we wanted, at, again, this is 1950s stupid. Remember when I keep complaining about 1950s science where it's like, 
we we were like we can do a thing but nobody stopped to think should we do a thing and this is one of these things the bradford pear it is the dumbest tree in the world we cultivated it so we basically made it it is basically an invasive species that we created from a pear tree from the northwest and we made it with a pear tree type from china and we got the Bradford pear because we wanted something that didn't fruit and looked pretty and would grow fast. And this is what we came up with. The stupid Bradford pear. This thing is so stupid that the top actually outgrows the bottom. You see, regular trees, what they do is they grow and they don't have their canopy grow too fast because that will, uh, it's too heavy it will split itself in half and kill itself. So the trunk grows proportional to the canopy of the weight up above. So trees don't commit suicide just by growing. Well, nobody told the Bradford pear that trick. And so the Bradford pear, uh, the canopy grows too fast, which we made it do. So it, if it doesn't kill itself by splitting in two, That's a good thing if it does that. Don't plant another one. So yeah, it outgrows itself because it grows too fast. And it kills itself because it grows too fast. The canopy gets too big for the trunk to hold it. And it usually splits off and kills itself. Hopefully it kills itself. And your baby going, gosh, you sound so harsh. Oh no, I'm getting worse. It gets worse. So anyway, so we made it not to have a fruiting part. So no, no gymnosperms. Or not, not gymnosperms. No, you know, gametophytes. We didn't want a gametophyte. We just wanted the sporophytes on these guys. So, yeah, they all also stink to high heaven. But the nine feet fifties were like, look at these trees. We can put them everywhere. They grow fast and they really look nice in all these new suburbs we're building. Because now we have these beautiful flowering trees that smell to high heaven and kill themselves in a couple of years. So that way, you know, these, these suburbs, they, they, they'll have nice trees and we don't have to wait forever for, you know, an apple tree or a freaking oak to grow. They'll just, bam, there you go. There's a tree in a couple of years. The DOT or down here was notorious for putting them in, especially when they were building a new highway. And in the midsection, they put Bradford pears. You can still see this annoyingly up in Raleigh and Durham. Mm -hmm. Now we started cutting them down and getting rid of them. But then they started regressing. Remember that Chinese? I said it, it, was, uh, it was a formulation, uh, a hybrid made from a, uh, you know, Northwestern uh, pear tree and a Chinese pear tree because the Chinese pear tree would like grow like crazy fast. So they were like, we're going to take the fastness of this, 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 uh, Jap uh, yeah, not Japanese, Chinese pear that was also considered uh, disgusting over in China. They they did they don't like that pear tree either because it actually grows these thorns that are like huge. And if you try to kill it and chop it back, it just comes back like it's it's like fighting kudzu down here. You we know about kudzu. It's like fighting kudzu, except it's bigger, it's tougher, and it has thorns. So imagine kudzu armed with thorns, and that's basically what I'm talking about right here. Not fun, not fun at all. So anyway, um, so they put them together and, um, um, and so what happens is in certain parts of the country, like the Midwest, they regress. Oh yeah. They regress and get the thorns and turn into huge brambles and like entire lots are taken over by these guys. And it's like, you need to go in with like a flamethrower and a freaking nuclear device to kill them off because they come back so fast they're just huge nuisances they're invasive uh invasive species created by humans stupid 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 the worst plant on earth the bradford pear never buy one never plant one they're nothing but nuisances get rid of them they're disgusting you're welcome that was my rant on the bradford pear because if you didn't hear it from me you're gonna hear it from and if you're into botany you're gonna hear it in the future no one likes in the scientific realm bradford pear yeah all right so anyway now that i've got off my uh, my going over the basic parts of the plant kingdom i mean i could go into more 
I could go into like different things about the Gagan Club Lava and stuff. I don't know. I'm gonna have to sit and see if we have enough time for that. If not, we're probably gonna hit after we get back from spring break, we're probably gonna hit uh animals. Is that right, Mounty? We could talk about us. Yay. And you. Would you like to talk about the reptiles? Yes. I will teach about snacks. I take it as a yes. Anyway. So there you go. There's my rant on the Bradford pear and plants in a snippet. So, like I said, if you'd like to hear that rant about, what was that? Was there another rant I wanted to rant about? Well, if you want to hear about that rant, let me know. I'll make a mini video that without, you know, all the editing and just throw it up if you want to hear me rant about that. So let me know. All right. With that said, you guys have a good, uh, since this is going up late, um, I'm probably not going to make it so the quiz isn't due until after you get back um, and a lot of other things because I don't want to like ruin your um, I don't want to ruin your spring break by you know watch this but you know and you may also notice God I put a lot of uh, chapters in your book to read um, yeah that's because like I said the plant kingdom is huge and talking about it is big. What I want you to go over is those first two chapters. So pretty much I want you definitely to read um, chapters 29 and 30. Uh, however, um, unit six, which is 30 chapters 35, 36, 37, 38, 39 are important, but I'm not going to hammer them um terribly much i'm going to touch on some things but not like a lot basically 29 30 is you know where i'm going to stick stay at but uh 35 36 37 38 39 if you want to take a quick skim of those i'd highly recommend but i'm not going to beat you to pieces with that because we just don't have time i mean if we want to do that you should if you really want to beat the plant kingdom to death i'd take a botany course says the zoologist so anyway because i wanted to get into animal kingdom and then talk about uh ecology because ecology is a pretty big thing so i maybe have some time for anatomy okay but that said i'll let you go you guys have a wonderful spring break party on uh don't party on too hard you know just the right amount moderation is good I'm going to be celebrating my son's birthday. So yeah, we're going to be kitty partying. Yay. So with that said, you guys take it easy. Um, and I'll see you after we get back from spring break. Hopefully I can record on Monday without something exploding. And that way this video would be out sooner. Yeah, right. Life ain't going to help me with that. Right, Monty? Okay. Well, with that said, Bye.